Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, Dimension Data's Google Hangout. For um, on the topic of uh, discussion today is going to be our, our newly released Network Barometer 2015, and and I'm, I'm quite excited. This is the seventh year in a row that um, that I've been involved in this Network Barometer. It's the seventh year overall. And um, and um, my name's uh, my name's Rich Schofield. I, I've worked for Dimension Data for quite a while in the network um, network integration line of business. And we also have uh, Raul. Raul, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, yep, Raul Takala here. I've been with Dimension Data quite a long time as well, although not as long as Mr. Schofield, uh, and have been affiliated with this network barometer report now for about five years. So uh, I'm excited as well. Mr. Van Skalkwijk. Uh, yes, my name is Andre. I'm responsible for consulting and assessments for our networking business unit. Also been with Dimension Data for a long time. Also not as long as Mr. Schofield. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, Rich. When we first started, when when we first started these network barometers, right? They were very focused, weren't they? Right? And it was and it, the original one, the first one that that um, that we did, I actually had done myself, and it was basically off the back of our our uh, technology lifecycle management assessment, right? When we were primarily focused on really the life cycle status of the uh, of the devices that we would um, that we would discover right so if we just kind of remind everybody what the technology life cycle management assessment is where it's it started off life in this information gathering mode determining hardware and software life cycle status and maintenance status as well uh, but then we, we we added to that we added the um, the Cisco P certs for example to add the security element um, and some of the architecture mapping to see what uh, what clients were able to support and not, and then also configuration compliance has been a big piece as well um, to determine the uh, the configuration fitness and the uh, identify maybe security risks of the uh, of the uh, the client's profile. So, um, so this year I think Raul, we did uh, it was over 350 assessments as I recall, over 70,000 um, devices that we discovered. So we actually have quite quite a, um, uh, a statistically relevant sample. I, I, I like to analogize it a little bit to, uh, to baseball stats, right? I mean, you have so many, so many hits, so many runs that you can really, you can go crazy with the stats, which has actually been quite fun. And I think that's an interesting part of this year's barometer, right, is that we, we've continued to add new and different angles and statistics to it. Yeah, well, so, you know, sorry, Rich, I'm, I didn't know if... Uh, uh, I think you're right there. I'm sorry. I think I cut you off. Go ahead. No, you go right ahead. Well, I was just going to say that, um, you know, as you say, uh, the network barometer report originally started out looking at uh, the life cycle stages of, uh, of network devices, right? So, um, you know, really, at the end of the day, that's a that's a, uh, a measure of age, in my view, you know, how old are our networks. And... Um, Interestingly enough, for uh, really the fifth year running, I think this is what the seventh year of the network barometer report. Correct. For the, yeah, for the fifth year in a row, we've had a slight increase in the age uh, of networking devices, right? Where right now about 53% of all devices that we discovered through those 350-odd assessments that Rich talked about um, are what we call aging or obsolete. And uh, really, in a technical term, that just means past end of sale, right? So you can no longer buy this uh, that device from the vendor. Um, but that's significant because every year, like I said, for the past five years in a row, there's been a little bit of an increment, right? Uh, it bottomed out at about 35% uh, five years ago. And every year, we see somewhere in the neighborhood of 3 to 5% increase in, uh, in um, aging and obsolete devices. Um, so clearly, uh, clients, uh, organizations are um, delaying their refresh. You know, back in the day, as soon as a manufacturer put something past into sale, there'd be this big rush to um, refresh uh, networking devices. That that certainly seems to have uh, fallen apart. You know, starting around 2010, uh, that's definitely not the case. Um, you know, yeah, go ahead. Roll a little bit on that. Um, so I, I think you you did identify a little bit of a difference between um, the direction that aging is tracking compared to the direction that obsolete is tracking. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, the the other thing. So just because a device is end of sale doesn't mean necessarily that its uh, useful life is over, right? So we do make a distinction between something that's obsolete. Uh, which really, at the end of the day, what that means is the original manufacturer will no longer support the device. 
right? I mean, so at that point, if, if the device breaks or needs an upgrade or something like that, you're pretty much out of luck. And um, so we track that metric, and that metric uh, is, uh, was 9% this year. 9% of all devices were obsolete, which the, the interesting thing about that is it's actually down slightly from last year, which it was 11% last year. But what we definitely have seen is a 10% uh, over the past seven years, 10% has uh, pretty much served to be the, that limit. It seems to be the, uh, every time we get up around 10%, it sort of it comes back the next year, right? Which is mm -hmm. exactly what we saw this year. So it seems that there's a, a tolerance or a threshold of about 10% of truly obsolete devices, even though the overall, let's say, universe is getting a little bit old, right? Like the, 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 the. What that sounds like to me, Raul, is it sounds like that people, um, they, they're, they're running... The um, their their aging equipment is close to the edge as they can get them, right? But then when it's over the edge into obsolete, they're saying, "Okay, now I'm past my comfort zone, and so I'm going to go ahead and, and refresh that because because I, I you know I want to get the most out of what I've got." Yeah, I, I I think that's clearly the case, right? I mean, the fact that every that the percentage of devices that are aging or obsolete just continues to creep up. As you say, Rich, I think you're right. There's just uh, they're, they're trying to push the limit, but then when they get to that, uh, you know, 10% of my devices are actually passed into support and therefore obsolete. Okay, now, now I'm past my comfort zone. I'm going to at least refresh those guys. So I think yeah, right. you're you're totally spot on. Uh, just just as an, as an interesting you know point of context, um, you know, we also looked at the age or the life cycle status of the devices uh, that Dimension Data manages on behalf of our clients, right? Um, uh, Rich, I think I, I interrupted you earlier, but you know, as, you, as I think you'll, you'll point out here in a second, we also looked at, at uh, statistics around devices we manage for clients. And interestingly enough, uh, our thresholds are a little bit different uh, than your average organization, right? So uh, we have, um, when we manage in the state for our clients, um, the, there, there still is a, you know, uh, a tendency to sweat assets a little bit because we do understand the financial benefits. but our own threshold for obsolescence is a little lower. And, and I think what you see there is a balance, certainly on the part of dimension data, to balance cost savings on the one hand, right, that's, you know, delaying refresh, but not at necessarily at the sacrifice of innovation, right? So, mm. you know, maybe not pushing it all the way to that 10%, and we tend to manage to about a 5 to 6% obsolescence. Mm. Uh, fresh. So that's that's a really good point because because it just seems to me that clients – yeah, you know what? The fact that it's obsolete and the client, the um, vendor doesn't support it anymore is a, that 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 can be sometimes a compelling argument. But I, I think sometimes clients are are, are somewhat, um, I guess the word might right word might be miffed that that's the reason they have to upgrade. But in the ideal world, what they really want to upgrade on. Uh, upgrade for is when they get new capabilities, right? So we know, and we know that there's that consumption gap, right? That that you've got um, you've got this new equipment that comes out with new features and new stuff that they can do, and they're more complex, harder to do, harder to absorb, harder to monetize and create business value out of the new features. So how are you seeing kind of that impact the refresh cycle? Well, so, so that's a great point. I mean, you know, our our advice all the time, uh, you know, has been historically, look, we get it. We get the financial benefits of sweating assets. But to your point, Rich, you know, you can't sacrifice innovation, right? So you still need to be able to support things like cloud, uh, enterprise mobility, collaboration. And, and, you know, the older a device is, the less sort of fit for purpose it is, right? So, you know, just on that note, I mean, when we think about innovation, Right, you know, some of the things again, kind of referring back to the, the discovery data we have. So we, we did look at that, and let, let's say let's specifically take enterprise mobility as we have an example. Um, we, we found a few interesting facts in the data. Firstly, you know, when we think about enterprise mobility, right, we think about um, you know uh, high bandwidth video and virtual desktop and collaboration tools, all coming to tablets and and smartphones and the like, right? So that really puts a significant stress on the wireless and the wired infrastructure, right? Because even though it's the end user connects wirelessly, that wireless access point connects to a wired port somewhere, right? So there is a combination of wired and wireless here. And so, so again, getting back to this innovation thing, we, we found two sort of interesting, uh, uh, interesting dichotomy. Firstly, 
74% of all the access points uh, we discovered actually are, are pre 802.11n. Okay, and 74, so three quarters of all access points out there are still sitting on the older versions of APs that are limited to about you know 50 odd megabits of throughput. Right, they're not taking the end users aren't necessarily taking advantage of the higher speed access points out there. Right, which is which was really surprising to us. So that's so. Just a quick comment on that. So that's a, that, what I find really interesting about that is the fact that that's not even really a very esoteric um, architectural thing. I mean, that's not that's not something that you'd say the client needs all kind of special capability and or or, or new skills or whatever to to get the business value with that. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah, not at all. I, I mean, I, that, most that's, people that's have that stuff at home, right? Right, and that's exactly why we point that one out in particular because to your point, sometimes there's this. Uh, this uh, you know belief that absorbing new technology, oh man, it's difficult to like you said monetize and find real business value. It, nothing is more straightforward than just wireless connectivity for these more advanced enterprise mobility applications, right? I mean, really, at the end of the day, we're just talking about higher throughput and better security. Who doesn't want that? Plug the thing in, and generally, yeah, there is some complication to it, but it's not hugely rocket science, right? Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's a big part. Now, conversely, on the wired side. So I just talked about how there seems to be kind of a lull and an access point refresh. But on the switching side, we're actually seeing some progress in, in terms of their ability to uh, support enterprise mobility. So for example, um, to support some of the higher speed access points, you need gigabit Ethernet ports, you need 10 gigabit uplinks on your switches, just sort of, again, plain vanilla type stuff. And we have seen significant improvement in that. We've seen an a, a increase in the uh, number of ports that can support power of Ethernet, that can support 10 gigabit uplinks. So it's, it's like the foundation is there, but it's not necessarily tied into this coherent enterprise mobility strategy where someone's saying, looking at the big picture and, and in a coherent fashion, targeting and, and refreshing their network to support enterprise mobility. It's almost kind of like piecemeal, if you know what I mean. Sure. Now that's I, I'll tell you that's that was one of the, um, the 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 best I thought one of the best new innovations in the uh, network barometer and the way to chop and slice and dice our data that you brought to the table when you when you came on board because like I said at the beginning of the this conversation that um, that you know each year we try to expand it add new angles new interesting information that really has um, uh, interesting applications and and to help guide. Uh, our clients who read the report to understand and compare what they're doing to what's happening in other people's um, environments. So, so you don't have to feel like the Lone Ranger. But I just think this is one of the cooler aspects that we've added in the last few years. So, yeah, so yeah, to you on that. Thank so, you. so Andre, you've been quite quiet this whole time. I, you're not just a pretty face. <laughs> you've been talking the whole time, Rich. Uh, me, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Andre. So, so I look. I think so. Um, you know, you you come in at at this um, the network barometer in a couple of angles. I mean, number one, you're you're quite involved with our with our uh, reference architectures and things. So some of the information that uh, Raul just pointed out pointed out, I think, is probably very interesting and and applicable to um, to, to some of your work here at Dimension Data. But also, um, you did a lot of work on the statistics around the the vulnerability pieces and the piece certs. Maybe maybe tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So, um, so interesting thing that we saw this year. So, so if we actually follow on from Raul with regards to wireless, you know, um, there was also a, a, a big conversation going on in the security field with regards to the impact that that IoT is going to have on on the networks and the impact that SDN will have on the networks and this whole automation concept coming into play. And you know, related to IoT, we actually feel that um, you know a lot of these devices that clients are starting to connect to the network will probably require um, IP version 6. You know, so not only you know, are we talking around um, you know, additional skill sets that clients need to bring into their environments, but it's also consequently got a security impact if uh, you, know, you have this, this uh, you, know, you can only control what you can see, right? Um, and uh, you know, we are seeing that there is quite a lot of IPv6 traffic already in the data centers, but that not all of the devices support or have capabilities of um, of really supporting security controls around IP version 6 traffic. Um, and consequently, the same with the vulnerabilities on these devices. You know, so this year, you know, we saw the same, as, uh, same in last year's report that the aging devices are definitely uh, more vulnerable, right? Um, and that's, uh, you know, it goes without saying because if you look at the life cycle of the devices, as current devices actually get pushed into the market, um, 
it actually takes a while, one, for the technology to be deployed, but also for, for security researchers and the operational guys to get their hands on these devices and actually try and tease out what the security issues are. So the later you actually go down the... Yes, sorry, Rich. Oh, no, I just want to ask you a question on that before you get too much further because you just made a comment that you said that um, the older devices are actually more, um, are, are more at risk. I think that's what you just said, right? Yeah, so we're so, actually seeing... So, I'm sorry? Yeah, so we're actually seeing more vulnerabilities on those devices, um, and that's that's basically due to the fact that the device has been in the market for a while. People have had the chance to actually uh, uh, work with it, test it, etc. So we are seeing that the aging devices typically have uh, more vulnerabilities associated with them than than the current and the obsolete devices. That's what I was going. That's what I was going to ask you. Why do you think that's the case? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, and you know, so an interesting thing that we looked at this year was, um, uh, you know. Our popular belief was that if you if you start chopping up the network based on wireless data center switches, your access switches, your aggregation routers, your voice route, uh, voice gateways, etc., that um, across those different architecture areas, um, the two areas that should be the most secure would be you know your data center switches and your wireless uh, infrastructure. You know wireless. Like because, I hope so. Yeah, exactly. You know wireless is um, uh, it's actually perimeter infrastructure if you think about it. Um, it spans outside of the the company premises, and the data center. That's really where the crown jewels are. You know, your uh, your critical business applications run in the data center, supporting critical business uh, processes. And what we actually saw this year was we looked at it from two angles. Firstly, which parts in the network actually have the most vulnerabilities? And um, you know, the data center switches and and edge routers here you know, were really the the two areas within the network that that had the most vulnerabilities, right? But if you start looking at it from a, um, you know, a, a penetration rate, so out of the vulnerabilities that we've seen on the discovered on the discovered devices, which of those vulnerabilities are actually active on all of the discovered devices? And then we actually saw that the two biggest culprits were wireless infrastructure and data center switches. You know, so this is interesting because these are really the two areas that you would expect. You know, are patched properly, configured properly, etc. And what we're seeing it's is the front door. Opposite. Exactly, exactly. Now, you know, this is interesting. Um, I, I don't really know why why wireless is in here, um, because really it's a no-brainer just to patch this infrastructure. The data center switches we are seeing uh, clients generally. Um, you know, having a slower patch cycle in the data centers. You know, there's it's a high risk environment. If you do patch and the device doesn't come up properly, uh, you know, it's it's a big area of the network to impact. Um, however, I think that really talks more to the fact that maybe the data centers are not architected uh, in the right way in order to support patch management, in order to support ongoing changes, etc. Um, and that's probably something that we're going to have to work with our clients on a little bit more uh, during this year. So, so another another um, angle, and, and actually, before I even get onto this, um, one of the things that um, you know, obviously, Andre, you have brought massively to the table for this year's barometer is just the work you did around uh, slicing and dicing the data. I mean, the, I mean, you, you did. I mean, Raul, you got to admit, Andre did yeoman's work with that data, and that's a, that's a good thing I'd like to uh, point out right now is a lot of times these reports tend to be stuff that's a result of a survey. Um, you know, CIOs, what they say about their environments, what their plans are. This is actual data that we've discovered in environments that say exactly what's there. Not a survey, actual deployments, actual data, actual pr proof points, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so what's interesting, so, yeah, sorry, continue, Rich. No, I was just going to try to transition us a little bit to talk a, a little bit maybe now on the services side. I don't know if you want to touch sides on that, but maybe you had another comment to make first. Yeah, uh, you know, you touched on a on a on a critical thing. Um, we had a conversation earlier today as well, looking at um, survey-based assessments, and you know, those are very uh, very subjective type of assessments. And and you you touched on the the money here uh, is that um, you know this is real data coming out of real networks, out of real clients. Uh, you know, so so what we're seeing is actually quite objective, um, and it's quite nice to look at because you know we've got tangible information to look at. Yeah, a lot of the work I think uh, we do every year is in normalization, right? 
because yeah. to do proper comparison, the data has got to be from from data, to, you know, from source to source. I mean, we have four or five GSCs around the globe, lots of data information, lots of on the services data side, and then obviously from the discovery side. I mean, we do we collect in a homogeneous way, but there's always little differences, right? Absolutely, and. You know, year on year, also the uh, the data set is different. You know, it's different client networks, uh, different um, countries that we're actually doing these assessments in. So, you know, there are differences on year to year. Um, but I think we can definitely extrapolate based on, uh, you know, the number of years that we've done this. You can actually start seeing trends forming uh, in the different environments. Now, anybody listening to this uh, right now, I mean, we're, we're not really talking dimension data specifically, but obviously, you know, we want to promote dimension data, our capabilities, and et cetera. And one of my favorites is this is a services discussion because uh, I really loved the, uh, the primary statistic we pulled out of this that shows how much we can shrink mean time to repair when clients are online with us. You want, want to tell us a little bit about that, Andre, maybe? Absolutely. So, um, you know, if we if we have a look at incidents in general, uh, this year we still saw that you know about a third of all the incidents are caused by human error. This means completely unavoidable. Uh, sorry, completely avoidable type of error. <laughs> Freudian slip. I know, exactly. Um, you know, and and, uh, and then also if you look at the maintenance contracts, you know, a lot of the contracts that we do have with clients are typical break fix type contracts, and. And 55% of the of the incidents that we see uh, are outside of that support contract. You know, and those are typical things such as uh, service provider links or power outages. You know, infrastructure that's not being built properly, etc. Um, you know, so it's quite interesting if we start looking at at that data alone, um, and then start looking at um, you know if if the environments were to be managed properly. Now, I just need to put a proviso in here. You know, I don't. I'm not going to preach and say that we do a fabulous job at managing networks, but I do think we do a significantly better job than others. Mm -hmm. um, and if we look at the two environments where we actually provide just a maintenance contract to a client versus an environment that we actually proactively monitor that client's network and, in a lot of cases, also manage those networks, we're actually starting to see a very interesting trend form here. So if you look at the life cycle of an incident, you really have two stages. The first one is your know, incident being logged, you know, so you're noticing that a device is down, and then this troubleshooting window starts, so you're really trying to figure out what is the cause of this outage. Once you've actually identified what the cause of the outage is, then you can send somebody to site, you can send the spare part, you can uh, you know, try and remediate the problem, etc. So what we've seen is that during that first window, so that troubleshooting or diagnostic phase, if the network is actually managed properly and, and monitored properly, and this is, again, out of our data set, um, we can actually reduce that troubleshooting time by 75%. Okay? And over the entire life cycle of that outage, we're actually able to reduce that outage by 32%. You know, so that's really looking at a, you know, if you have a look at a four-hour outage window, that's reducing it to three hours, um, which is phenomenal. Now, now, one thing um, I, that I think is interesting about that, and next year I'd like to maybe see if we can nail this one down, but the numbers are so large, you have to presume that even in environments where we monitor just the stuff we maintain, even though they have an internal monitoring system, you still gain some of those efficiencies because we find out right away, even fast, even faster than if the client picks it up on their monitoring systems and calls us. We get the accurate information right away. Ticket gets generated right away. So you still have some of that benefit, irrespective of whether or not it's a, it's a monitoring overlay to something else the client already has. Absolutely, and as part of that monitoring, the monitoring from generated before the outage actually occurs. So there's a lot of context. Um, that comes to the fore that actually helps to reduce this, uh, this troubleshooting cycle. So I don't know if there's um, going to be any questions or anything, but if we just kind of kind of wrap up where we are, I, I mean, look, all of a sudden I get a major echo. Um, but anyway, I'll try to keep going. So, so I think the couple of key points are, number one, that um, sweating your assets is okay, right? You just don't want to do it blindly. You don't want to stick your head in the sand like an ostrich. You want to make sure you know how old the stuff is, how close to the um, obsolete level they are, that you've got a uh, an approach to ma managing the risk and making it smaller. You want to standardize all your technologies and your configurations to reduce that human error that you talked about. 
Andre that increases uh, downtime. Um, automation of day-to-day -day tasks, um, which again, Dimension Data does naturally through our through our our, um, our managed services office, and uh, and monitoring network devices closely is key as well to get the uh, to get some of that uh, downward pressure on the meantime to repair. So I don't know if there's any questions out there, JJ. Would they come into you? Okay. Well, if they would come into us, I haven't seen them. Um, did you guys get any on your side? All right, Andre's completely out. Can't hear him at all. Okay, no questions that came up. Okay, great. So listen, now I'm with that. Unless um, anybody wants to add anything at the end here, I think that uh, that's kind of all the stuff we wanted to chat about. Um, again, I'm very excited about the uh, the network barometer. You can get a copy of it by connecting to uh, www.dimensiondata.com. You'll see a link right on the home page that will allow you to navigate to the report and download it. And I would. Uh, I think all three of us would highly encourage you to download it. We're extremely proud of the uh, the results and the output, and uh, happy reading. Thanks for joining, guys. Cheers. Thanks, Rich.